As you're being seated, I want to tell you what we have available. Some of you have asked because you may have heard us mention this before. The Faith and Confession Study Guide is available back here in the media store. It is a companion book to this. Many of you have already bought this, Charles Capps' Faith and Confession. Uh, we recently had Annette Capps, uh, who is now the CEO of Capps Ministry, and she was on talking about um, this, as well as a DVD set that they have that goes with it, um, as a Bible study course. And she said her father made the statement that he considered this to be one of the most encompassing books con concerning all of the things that God had, had placed upon his responsibility to preach concerning faith and confession. And it is one of the most thorough of his teachings concerning faith and confession. And if you just think, well, it's going to talk to you about the power of your words, you, you haven't de delved into the depths of what Brother Capps taught about um, because he talks about um, being um, accurate in uh, your, your steps of action to have balance and corresponding action that you, you um, not to get out of balance. He really had one of the greatest teachings about uh, being able to keep your faith in line so that you're not going out and doing things that are presumptuous and calling them faith. And so um, that is, is available. The study guide takes you chapter through chapter to help you um, to actually use it like a, um, a study guide, a course to go through this teaching. So I encourage you if you already have this book, just step back and get this one. If you don't have either one of them, invest in your spiritual library. Glory to God. It will be a blessing to you. Now let's turn together to the book of Genesis chapter 17. I've been challenged by the Lord to, to help us give an emphasis. And, and I want to just um, share with you the motivation, when I spoke this morning in the service and I made mention of the fact that when you look at the legal side of redemption, you can find what is ours legally according to the covenant. And what happens many times is that people see the legal side through the word of God. God reveals it to them. This is legally theirs. And then they look at their situation they look at their life and they say, well, I don't have that working. That's not working for me. I don't have that manifest in my life. And so this is what we would call the vital side, what's living in, in your life, what's working in your life. And when you see there are things on the legal side that are not operating in the vital side, in order for you to bring up what you are walking in, it's going to take the preaching of the gospel. And you're going to have to let the Word of God challenge you to help you come up in what you're walking in. And it is possible for us to walk in the fullness of that legal side of redemption. Amen. It's possible. And the, the objective then is to, the, to preach what's going to bring us to that point. To preach what's going to cause us to be able to walk in the fullness because... That what's legally ours must be operated by faith. In order for us to walk in the fullness of our healing, the fullness of our wealth, the fullness of our protection, the fullness of our wisdom and our supply, it's going to require the preaching that will cause the faith to come for us to walk in it. Amen? So let's just release our faith right now. For the Holy Spirit to minister to us through the Word of God and open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Make ourselves yielded to the leading of the Spirit. Lord, we just, we just yield ourselves to the teacher. We just yield ourselves to the, the flow of your Holy Spirit to help us identify, Lord, to stir us, to, to empower us through your Word to bring us into a greater manifestation of what's ours legally. And we just submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit and we ask and we yield and, and request 
for that greater light. We request to have in greater operation in our life these truths. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Genesis 17 is where I want to start, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. The phrase I want to give our emphasis to tonight is this phrase where God introduces himself. He says, I am God Almighty. I am the Almighty God. In the original Hebrew language, he says, I am El Shaddai. Well, because we weren't raised in Hebrew tradition unless you've been in church long enough to hear different sermons about the names of God or different things, you may not have an understanding. What is, what is El Shaddai? We used to sing a song, Jehovah Jireh, He is my God. Well, some people who haven't been brought up don't know what is, is He different than God? You know, Jehovah Jireh. The names of God, and, and when we, the Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, those different names, We would refer to those as the seven redemptive names of God. And those different names were different aspects of his character. El Shaddai is also an aspect of his character. And so when he gives these names, when we see these different names for God, we are recognizing that he is displaying who he is. He is describing to us who he is. For instance, when the name Jehovah Jireh was, it was there in the Bible, it was because Abraham on the mountain in the momentum of, of preparing to uh, sacrifice his son, he had made the statement, God himself will provide a sacrifice. He gets up there, he's obeying God in giving God his only son. And in that moment, the angel stops him, the voice calls from heaven and says, there is a look behind you. There's a ram in the, thicket, in the thicket because I've seen that you will obey my voice and you have not begrudged me your son. And he turns around and there is a ram with its horns caught in a thicket. And Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh. That's the name he gave that place on the mountain. He says, right here at this location, at this moment in time, I came to know God in a way I'd never known him before. I have now experienced a characteristic. I've come to a point in my relationship with God that I know him as the God who sees and provides. I know him as the God who is my provider at this very moment. It was a revelation to him of God in that aspect of his character. And this is what God is saying as he's talking to Abraham here in 17.1. He says, I am the God of more than enough. I am the all-sufficient God, El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. King James translated it the almighty, having all power, all ability. But if you were to look at the, the definition in a greater sense, In the Hebrew language, it is God who is more than enough. God who is all sufficient. It's not just limited to finances, but surely finances are included in more than enough. The God of more than enough, the God who is all sufficient. He said, Abraham, I'm introducing you to who I am as the all sufficient one. And God wants you and I to know him. He wants us to know Him. I know Him as all-sufficient. I know Him as the God who is more than enough. He is more than enough to me. He has proven Himself to me to be the God who is more than enough. And for Him to prove Himself and for Him to demonstrate Himself and display Himself in your life, He's going to have to meet your needs with more. He's going to have to fill the need with extra. 
He wants you to know him that way. He, he says, give me an opportunity to display myself to you and to introduce myself to you so that you can come away from this conversation knowing I just experienced God who is more than enough. You know, there are people who know Jesus as their, the savior of their sin, but they've never known him as the healer of their body. He wants them to know he is not just the savior of your sin, but he's also the healer of your body. He's also the lifter of your head. He's also the captain of your salvation. He's also your alpha and your omega, your beginning and your end. He wants you to know every aspect of who he is. And to do that, you're going to have to let him be that in your life. And God's saying, I want to be your God of more than enough. I want to show you I am more than enough to meet that need. I am more than enough to supply what you need in that situation. I am the God of more than enough. I am the all-sufficient one. There's nothing lacking in me. There's no shortage in me. There's no insufficiency in me. You'll never come to the end of God's ability to provide. You'll never come to the end of God's sufficiency. He's not just the God of enough. He doesn't want you to know him as the God of enough. I serve the God of just enough. He never wants that for his people. Amen. The wilderness was the land of just enough. It was not God's plan for them to be there as long as they were there. He never wants his people walking away saying, I serve the God of just enough and I'm glad for the just enough. He wants you to call him by who he really is. My God is more than enough. I know him that way. I'm intimately acquainted with his sufficiency. So he refers to himself. He introduces himself. And, and I, I challenge you tonight to open up your life to invite him to be who he is in your life, the God of more than enough. Jeremiah chapter 32 is... I say one of my favorite verses, but, you know, just read the Bible for a while and you're going to have a whole lot of favorite verses too. <laughs> Jeremiah 32, 40, 41. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good. I will rejoice over them to do them good. That's what God wants. That's what gives God rejoicing. That's what makes God get off the throne and dance. Yeah, yeah. He says, I will rejoice. I mean, we get happy around here. We get, we get rejoicing. We, get, we jump. We bounce. We shout. We run. I heard y'all had a running spell last Sunday night, right? We rejoice. So does God. God rejoices. Can you see him? The opportunity arises and he just had the, a, an opening come up in your life where he was able to bless you and he says, angels, clear the path, I'm about to run. And he jumps up off the throne and goes running around the throne room, dancing. Why? Because he rejoices over you to do you good. Hallelujah! God says, I rejoice over you to do you good. And I will plant you in this land. Assuredly, with my whole heart and my whole soul, do you see God's passionate about doing us good? He's passionate about it. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 2, I want to read the amplified version of verse 10. He's passionate about doing us good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2.10 in the Amplified Bible. We are God's own handiwork, His workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand. Taking for us, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which He prepared ahead of time. Aren't you glad there's already a path? You don't have to clear the way. The path is already made. He's prepared it 
that we should walk in those paths he's prepared ahead of time. Walking in those paths he's prepared ahead of time is also equivalent to living the good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Living the good life. Hallelujah. So God, who rejoices over us to do us good, who desires for us to know Him as the God of more than enough, has already prepared paths that will lead you into a life that is considered so good, the good life, and He's prearranged it. He's already made it ready. Hallelujah. If you're not there yet, don't get in condemnation. God's just not through with you. Keep walking. Keep stepping. Start stepping. Follow the path. He's leading you into the good life. He wants you to know Him as the God who is more than enough. He wants you to see Him in His sufficiency. He wants you to know Him as the God of surplus. The God who causes your cup to run over. The God who blesses you so that there's just not enough room on your property. You need some more property for all those cows and all those sheep. God who is more than enough. Psalm chapter 35 verse 27. We're just going to let the word of God minister to us tonight. Psalm 35 27. If you feel like shouting, shout. If you feel like chewing, chew. Just no spitting. No spitting on the floor. I'm not talking about that kind of chew, y'all. No, chew the word, chew the word, chew the word. Psalm 35, 27. Let them shout for joy. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord! And be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually... Let the Lord be magnified which has pleasure in the prosperity of His people, His servant. Under the Old Testament, God had pleasure in the prosperity of His servant. How much more in the New Testament as a son of God, as a child of God, as an heir of God, how much more does He take pleasure in your prospering? I'll answer you. Much more. Much more. It pleases him much more. Why? Because you're his child. You're his heir. He wants you to prosper. Notice it says, let them say continually. Notice we're shouting for joy. We are glad because we favor his covenant cause, his righteous cause. And as a result, we're going to be experiencing this prosperity. And he wants us to say it. Let the Lord be magnified. Let the Lord be magnified, which takes pleasure in the prosperity of Philip and Michelle Steele. Let the Lord be magnified, which takes pleasure in the prosperity of Faith Builders International. Let the Lord be magnified, which... And you put your name there. He takes pleasure in your prosperity. See God with a big smile on his face because he was able to bless Jamie Wilder. And God says, Woo! Hallelujah! I just blessed my people. I just bless Charles and Cynthia. I just bless Johnny. And, and, oh, it just makes me thrilled. It thrills him. See the smile on his face, Brother Charles. See that smile on his face. And God's saying, God's saying, it pleases me to bless you. It pleases me to bless you. It pleases me to bless you. God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his people. Anybody want to please the Lord? I do always those things that please Him. Amen? So it brings Him pleasure. Not only does it bring God pleasure, but if we return back to Jeremiah and we look at the following chapter, we find out He's not only pleased, but He receives glory and honor by our prospering, by Him prospering us. Why? Because he's the one who did it. In chapter 33, verse 9, he says, It shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. 
Unto who? The people he's rejoicing over to do them good. He says people are going to hear about what he's done for you. People are going to hear about how he's blessed you. People are going to hear about how he prospered you. And it will be to me a name of joy, a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. And they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. It's going to be a name of honor to God. It's going to bring God glory and honor and praise when people look at you and see all of the goodness and the prosperity that He has poured out on your life. Hallelujah! God's going to be glorified. God's going to be glorified by our prospering. Hallelujah. Psalm chapter 25. I want, to, I want to, to ask you this question, and we're going to answer it with this verse. What has God authored for us? What has God planned and authored in His plan for you and I? Psalm 25 describes it for us. Because we are those who fear the Lord. We are those who respect and honor and reverence Him. Hallelujah. In verse 25, I'm sorry, chapter 25, verse 12. What man is he that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease. You should underline that. Circle that. Dwell at ease. His soul shall dwell at ease and his seed shall inherit the earth. Well, you look at that just from this King James translation, dwell at ease, and that sounds comfortable enough, doesn't it? You see recliner, iced tea with a straw stuck in it maybe, you know. Woo! No, that's not what it's referring to. The Hebrew language brings out a greater definition of this, this phrase, dwell at ease. This dwelling at ease is referring to prospering. The New International Version says, Who then are those that fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways he sh they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity. That is the life God has offered for us. They will spend their days. That word ease in the Hebrew is defined prosperity, bountiful wealth and good in the widest possible sense. In the widest possible sense. Bountiful wealth and good. Hallelujah. Somebody's establishing something. Widest, in the widest possible sense. So that's not just enough. Bountiful wealth. If anybody gets bountiful wealth, who do you think God wants to have it? Those people who are sold out to Him and are going to do righteous things with their bountiful wealth and be a blessing with it? Do you think God created the wealth on the earth for the drug dealer to have it? For the cartels to have it? Do you think God created all this great wealth and bountiful pleasures on the earth for people who are in the pornography industry or the gambling industry ruining people's lives to enjoy prosperity? No. Their prosperity comes with terror and fear that it's going to be taken from them. Their prosperity is flighty. It's here today and gone tomorrow. But he put for the blessed a durable wealth and riches. Durable wealth and riches comes with wisdom. He created this prosperity for us. And when we walk uprightly before him, he will bring it into our lives. He will, the, the blessing of the Lord, it says that, that uh, it, it, it will overtake you. When you hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all these commandments, the blessing shall overtake you. The blessing shall come on you and overtake you. I'm talking about, have you ever had anybody jump on you from behind? We were out doing Operation Sunshine one day, you know, going out into the neighborhood and inviting kids to come down in the projects to, to a, a little event that we were doing for them. And this, this bless his heart, he was probably six foot two and he was a little bit 
uh, underdeveloped in his thinking, and so he kind of had like a 12-year-old mentality, and, and he was so excited because we were the Popsicle Patrol, and we had the Popsicles and the memory verses, and he came running from behind, and this six-foot-two boy jumped on my back. <laughs> And Kathleen and Marie were both there, armor bearers. Talk about an armor bearer fail. They were just like, ah! <laughs> I mean, it was an armor bearer. Worst day out, you know? Six foot two, this big old boy is on my back. I mean, riding me like, you know, how you put the kids on your back. And he's got his legs right here in around my waist. Woo! But I'm telling you, that's how the blessing is going to overtake you. I mean, you're going to be walking along one day and the blessing is going to jump on your back and you're going to be, you're going to be trying to hold your balance for the blessing that's coming on you. The blessing coming on you and overtaking you. Overtaking you. Overtaking you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Why? Because that's how God works. He says, I bless the upright. What man is he that fears the Lord? Him shall God teach in the way we should choose. His soul shall dwell in prosperity. He will spend his days in prosperity and our descendants will inherit the land. New Living Translation says they will live in prosperity. I'm preaching it so you can bring your living up to, to the fullness of what's yours legally. I'm telling you this belongs to you. Amen. This is your inheritance. This is your right to own and to walk in the fullness of the blessing. They will live in prosperity, bountiful wealth and good in the widest possible sense. Not only is God okay with it, but it was his idea before you ever thought about it. He's trying to talk you into it. Philippians chapter 4. We're familiar with this verse here. We've spent a number of weeks putting in order this verse from chapter 4 verse 19 that tells us, My God shall supply all my need according, all your need, according to His riches in glory. Now I want you to give a different emphasis this week as we look at this verse. I want you to look at that phrase, according to. According to. God supplies need according to His riches, not according to the size of your need. It's according to His riches. God supplies needs according to His riches. And this is where we've got to train our mind not to have sticker shock. We've got to train our mind not to see our financial need and give it honor. Ooh, this is such a big need. This is so much money. Ooh, what, what's getting the honor there? The need. The need suddenly has this place of awe. God is the one who's awesome. He is the one who is worthy of our all, not the need. God supplies need according to His riches. Is there a limit to His riches? No. Is there a shortage in His riches? No. Is there a struggle in His riches? So when we recognize that God supplies needs in according to, in harmony with, based on the size of His riches, then it, whatever the need may be, it's still not worthy of com being compared to the riches in Christ. The riches in the glory. It's not worthy to be compared. This is why one of the things that the Holy Spirit had the Apostle Paul praying for the church at Ephesus is that they would know what are the riches of the glory in the inheritance. He, the Holy Spirit is still wanting us to know that. Amen. He wants you to know what are the riches of the glory of our inheritance in the saints of life. What are the riches of the glory? Because if you've got your awe, 
If you've got your honor, if you've got your, your, um, your focus on the riches of the glory, there's no need that's ever going to come up that's going to get your all. That you're going to say, oh, that's a big need. Whew, that's an expensive airplane. Whew, how are we going to pay that off? Whew, how are we going to buy that? Whew, how are we going to... No. God's riches and glory... That's how he supplies. Here's, here's a way to look at it. You know, uh, we have a two-year-old, almost two. She's going to be two in November, Liliana. Amen. She has a little spoon that she eats her eggs with in the morning. That spoon wouldn't do me any good. <laughs> it would take me three times as long to get my eggs eaten with that little tiny spoon. But it fits her mouth well. It fits her mouth. But God is not supplying your need based on your spoon. Your spoon is much smaller than the spoon he uses. God is serving out your supply out of his big industrial sized kitchen spoon. It's his riches and glory that he's meeting the need out of. God's not going by, he, and this is what I'm trying to tell you. He's not just wanting to meet the need barely. And then just leave you with another need that's about to happen coming up next week. No, he, he wants it to be his big industrial size serving spoon coming over to your little plate, and then your plate is running over. According to... His riches, according to His riches, according, God supplies need according to His riches. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. According to His riches. That woman came, listen, a woman came and said, listen, came to the prophet and said, listen, my husband, your servant, he was, a, he was a prophet. He was serving God. He was a man who feared God. My, hus my husband, your servant, is dead. And because of this debt that's left in my life, they're coming to take my sons to pay the debt that we still owe. And he said, what's in your house? And she said, I don't have anything in my house. I don't have anything in my house. Look how bad it was. Look how their need, look how big their need was. I have nothing. In she wasn't even in the condition of that widow who had... A little bit of a meal and a little bit of oil. She didn't have no meal. She just had the oil. That's all she had. She couldn't even make the cake to get the blessing. She said, we have nothing left in the house but a little bit of oil. And he said, you go get as many empty containers as you can borrow from all your friends and neighbors. Not a few. Get as many empty vessels as you can get. Get up in your house, shut the door, and you and your son start pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. And that's what she did. They poured and they poured. They, with that little pot of oil, that little bit of oil that she had left in her miserable situation, and then they filled every empty vessel that they had brought into the house. She said, give me another one. There's not another one. The oil stopped. She went back to the man of God, said, what do I do now? He said, sell it. Pay your debt and, and live. You and your sons live. Not just you. We're talking about generations. Her and her next generation, y'all live on the rest. There was such an inheritance left, such a supply left, such an overflow and abundance left because God supplies need based on his riches and glory. His riches and glory. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They came to Jesus and he said, these people are hungry and we're going to feed them. What do you have? And they said, we don't have enough money so that every one of them could get just a little bite. It would take two months worth of food. It would take 200 penny worth of bread. So that, and all we would do with that was every person would get one tiny bite. And then Andrew said, well, there is a little boy here. And he's got two fish and five loaves of bread. But what is that among so many? See the need? So many. Not enough. So 
so that everybody could even have one tiny bite. And he said, bring that fish and those pieces of bread to me. And he blessed and he broke and he handed it to the disciples and they started passing it out and passing it out and passing it out. And when everyone had eaten and was filled, 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 they didn't just get a bite. Every person ate to the full, to the full. And guess what? He said, start gathering up the fragments that remain because there are leftovers. Because God meets needs according to His riches and glory. God meeting your need according to His riches means He wants you to have supply left over. He wants to meet the need and you still have money in the bank. He wants to meet the need and you still have some spending cash to enjoy yourself with. He wants to meet the need above and beyond. He's not, he doesn't want you to know Him as the God of enough. He wants you to know Him for who He is. He is the God of more than enough. He says, That's, I want you to know me like that. I want you to know this is who I am. I want you to know this is who I am. I am the God of more than enough. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This same verse in the Bible in basic English says, My God will give you all you have need of from the wealth of His glory in Christ Jesus. This verse is uh, originally in the Greek language. In the Greek language it says this. If you were to take each of the definitions from this Greek phrase, it would say, My God will liberally supply, fill to the full, cram. Hey! Cram! Can you see God just cramming your supply in there? Come on, there's still a little bit of air in there. Push it down. Stay. Hey, come here, come here. Gideon, stand on this real quick. Just jump up and down. Push it down. Cram it in there. Cram it in there. Cram that supply in there. My God will liberally supply. Fill to the full. Cram. Furnish. Satisfy. Satisfy. Finish and complete all your needs. Employment. Requirements. Lack. And business, according to his riches, his wealth, his money, and his possessions in glory by Christ Jesus. That's how God meets needs. That's how God supplies needs. That's how God supplies needs. According to his riches. In line with, from, from the measurements of his wealth. Not the measurement of your need. God is not moved by the size of your need. He's not intimidated by the size of your need. He said, that's okay, that's okay. I got that right here in my jeans. Got that. I, I got that. That's not a problem. I got that. My God shall supply according to his riches. Ephesians 3 is a verse that we refer to often. We actually referred to it this morning. Talking about the resurrection power. But it also refers to God's measurement of doing. Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able, he has the power, he has the sufficiency, the almighty, the all-powerful one, the all-sufficient one, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all. In the original text, this is such a heavy usage of, of adverbs, of, try, of descriptive words trying to get across. The Holy Spirit had to find three of the most powerful words that the language provided for Him to use to try to express God's capability. In any situation. And he had to, to stack them. I mean back to back. Expressive. 
descriptions of God's ability. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all. That's not just enough. It didn't say God is able to do just enough of what you can ask or think. No, the Holy Spirit had to back to back line up these words to hone in and and focus in and get across to us that God is able. God has the ability. God can meet the need exceeding abundantly above all. Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. The Amplified says super abundantly, far over and above all, infinitely beyond, infinitely beyond, super abundantly. Now, now, do you remember what the Holy Spirit showed us this morning? With the, man, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. My believing this is estimated to be a value of my right standing to receive it. The reason I can receive this is because I believe it. My believing it is placed into my account with an estimated value that she is in right standing to receive that infinitely exceeding above and beyond. Why? Because she believes it. She believes God is more than enough. She believes God supplies her needs according to his riches and glory. Hallelujah. 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 To whom shall the arm of the Lord be revealed? To the one who shall believe his report. <laughs> who shall believe his report and to whom shall the arm of the... Well, the arm of the Lord's going to be revealed to the one who believes it. Yes. How, are we, how are we going to believe it? Faith comes by hearing. And hearing the preached word. Hearing the spoken word. Hearing the rhema word. Hallelujah. I'm preaching it so you can get it. Because God, God wants you to know him as the God who is more than enough. He wants us walking in the door saying, I have a testimony about my God who is more than enough. He wants us singing that, my God is more than enough. He shall supply all my needs. He is my El Shaddai. He's always Come on, he wants us to have that in our mouth, right? Jehovah Jireh, he is my God. Psalm 65, verse 11. I'm just showing you what the Bible says. Legally ours. We're going to walk in what's legally ours. Psalm 65, verse 11. You crown the year with your goodness. You crown the year with your goodness. And your paths drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. Why? Because he's crowning our year with his goodness. The New Living Translation refers to this goodness as a bountiful harvest. You crown our year with a bountiful harvest. The NIV uses the phrase, with your bounty. You crown our year with your bounty. The New Living says, you crown my year with a bountiful harvest. And even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. Even the hard pathways are overflowing with abundance. Hallelujah. Psalm 66 verse 12. You you have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. But you brought us out into a wealthy place. Praise God. That when we were in our hiding place, you caused those people to ride right above our heads and not even see where we were camped out. Thank you, Lord, for your protection in that hard time. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me through the fire and through the water. But God doesn't want to just keep you through the struggle. He wants to bring you into the wealthy place. 
He is your keeper in times of trouble. He is your protection in that difficult situation. He will hide you so that those, those enemies ride right over your head and never see you. He will keep you through the fire and through the water, but he wants, to, he wants to do more than just the keeping. He wants to bring you out in two. He was the God who brought them out of Egypt. And he was the God who saw and protected them through the wilderness. But he desired to bring them into a land that flowed with milk and honey. A wealthy place. You bring us out into a wealthy place. A wealthy place. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Psalm 85, 12. Hallelujah. A wealthy place. A wealthy place. Even the hard paths are overflowing with abundance. He's crowning our year with a bountiful harvest. Psalm 85, 12. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good. He rejoices over us to do us good. He's going to do so much good and prosperity in our life that it is going to be a name of praise to Him when people see what good He's done for us. The Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield its increase. The New Living says the Lord pours down His blessings, and our, our land will yield its bountiful harvest. I'm showing you a picture of abundance. I'm showing you a picture of more than enough. I'm showing you a picture of when God is at work in our life, His desire is to bring an abundance. His desire is to bring a surplus. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34, he is referring to our covenant. In verse 25, he says, I will make with them a covenant of peace, and I will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods, and I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. God says, I will make where you are and I will make you. I will make them and the places. I will make you and the place you're in. I'll make you a blessing and I'll make your house a blessing, and I'll make your checking account a blessing, and I'll make your wallet blessed, and I'll make your car blessed, and I'll make your house blessed, and I'll make your driveway blessed, and I'll make your job blessed. I'll make you and every place you're in blessed, blessed, blessed. Why? Because I'm going to make showers of blessing. Showers of blessing. This word shower... This word shower in the Hebrew means, it's not talking about just a little spring shower, a little bit of uh, 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 moist on the, on the flowers. No, this word shower means to pour down violently. I'm talking about toad strangling showers of blessing. I'm talking about showers of blessing that you can't, you can't, you got to pull over on the side of the road. You can't drive because the rain's coming down so hard. God says, that, that's the kind of showers of blessing I'm bringing. The blessing that pours down violently. You know, when, it, when, when that kind of rain comes, it doesn't take long before all of the empty places start filling. I mean, the ditches on the sides of the roads get full. The ponds get full. I, I'm talking about every empty place start filling up. God says, showers of blessing. It can be empty on one day and full the next. Come on. They found themselves out in the middle of the wilderness too far away to get back. And they called for the man of God, Jehoshaphat, and these other kings that had gone out with him. And they called for the man of God and said, what do we do? There's no way we can get everybody back to a water supply. We're out here. We're going we're gonna to die from lack of water. What do we do? And so he sought the Lord, and God said, Make this valley full of ditches. What? <laughs> we're, we're out here with no water and not enough water for our horses. We've got all these armies of men, and he wants us to do what? Make this valley full of ditches. 
Start digging ditches. I need empty places to fill. I need empty places to fill. And in the morning when the enemy came up over the hill, God had filled every ditch in the valley with water. But the, when the sunrise, the sunrise hit that water, it looked like blood. And there was a fear that came over those people. They thought there had been a victory already. And they started, they, they started fighting amongst themselves. And, and they didn't even have to fight. God's people just got up and wow. <laughs> victory is mine. Victory today is mine. Why? Because they saw the valleys full of water and thought it was blood. But God is the one who filled every ditch. They dug it, but God filled them. They woke up in the morning and every empty place was full. God can fill every empty place overnight. He can fill your empty place as showers. Showers of blessing. Showers. This word, if you were to define it from the dictionary, says a falling of things from the air in thick succession and in great and large quantities. That's what a shower is. And God says, there shall be. Is that in your Bible? There shall be. That's like covenant talk, right? There shall be. He's talking about the covenant we have. The covenant of peace is our covenant. There shall be showers of blessing, a falling of blessings from the air in thick succession and in great and large quantities. Hallelujah. This is what Malachi 3 was talking about. I will open up to you the windows of heaven and pour you out blessing. How's it going to come? Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing. Now these showers of blessing bring supply. Go back with me to the book of Leviticus. I want you to see supply. I want you to start thinking supply. I, don't, I, I want us to, to bring the renewing of our mind concerning supply and provision. And I want us to never again permit a just enough image in our heart. I want us to never again allow us seeing just barely getting by or just enough. I want us to, to submit ourselves to knowing God as the God of more than enough and allowing Him to put this image of a supply and a surplus in our life. Leviticus 26 is a companion, you could say, to Deuteronomy 28. Leviticus 26 talks about the blessing as well. And I want to go specifically to verse 10. In, he said, You will eat old store and bring forth the old because of the new. Bring me amplified up if you would please. You shall eat of the old... And bring forth the old because of the new. You shall eat the abundant old store of produce long kept. And clear out the old to make room for the new. Now those of you who ever had any person in your life that loved to can. My grandmother, after she moved to heaven, my aunt said she went downstairs and there were pickles for years to come. Bread and butter, pickles, corn. She always did tomatoes and okra. I mean, there was supply. She had not cleaned out the old. She just kept pouring it, putting the new in, putting the new in. God says that there's going to be such an abundant influx of supply that you're going to have to take the old out to make room for the new. Does that sound like you're about to run out before you get another one? You know, one of the things that God asked me when he said, what are you going to do differently when I bring you out of debt? I said, well, I'm going to shop different. Because up until that time, we waited until we were about out of hairspray to buy a new can. We were almost out of deodorant. I mean, you better hope <laughs> you don't 
push it too far, we might say, go to the store now. Because, I mean, you know, down to the last roll of toilet paper, the last can of deodorant, the last of the hairspray, the last of the dishwashing, we just waited till we ran out to buy the new. I said, when I have a supply, I'm going to go and I'm going to stock my shelves. I'm going to open up the cabinet and I'm going to see those cans of, of deodorant stacked up like soldiers in the cabinet. You know, I want to open up and let there be paper towels. Let there be dishwashing detergent. You know, this living paycheck to paycheck had, had caused me to shop that way. And that was something that God had to store. Store, and not only store, but he's going to bring, this is talking about the blessing, I will multiply you, the previous verse said. I will multiply you. I will have respect towards you. I will multiply you, and I will bring you to a place where you've got to clear out. we got a new supply coming. Come on, I need to clear out last year's skirts and dresses and shoes. Come on, ladies, I need a big amen for this. Because there's a new supply. Look what God has brought into my wardrobe. Make room for the new. Make room for the new. You will eat the abundant old store. You will eat the abundant old store of produce long and clear out the old to make room for the new. Why? Because he's the God of more than enough. Now, God's plan... For our prosperity is not temporary. It's for a lifetime. Psalm 92, 12. It's for a lifetime. God wants this to be your lifestyle. This, he wants this to be your continual way of living. Psalm 92, 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow up like a cedar in Lebanon. Flourish is a key word here. Let's look at this word flourish from the Hebrew dictionary. It means to increase. The righteous shall increase. It also means to enlarge. The righteous shall enlarge. The Hebrew Bible says it becomes, this word means to become extremely successful. The righteous, put your name there. Aaron Harper shall become extremely successful. Put your name there. Michelle Smart shall become extremely successful. Hallelujah. Amen. Extremely successful. Enter into a state of prosperity. Enter into a state of prosperity. Grow exuberantly, increase in wealth, favor, and honor. That's what flourish means. The righteous shall enter into a state of prosperity. Grow exuberantly, increase in wealth, favor, and honor. Can God, who is more than enough, do that in our lives? Can He bring us into this so that we spend our days in prosperity? Hallelujah. So you could say, I am increasing. I am enlarging. I am becoming extremely successful. I have entered into a state of prosperity. I am growing exuberantly and increasing in wealth, favor, and honor. Hallelujah. Notice this is for a lifetime. This is for a lifetime. It goes on and it says, Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. There's that same word again, flourish. Increase, enlarge, become extremely successful in the courts of our God. We shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Why? Because this flourishing isn't just a temporary flow. It is a continual flourishing even into our, our golden years. We will bring forth fruit in old age and we shall be continually flourishing. The word fat means well watered and flourishing. A supply, 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 supply. No shortage, no lack. 
No shortage, no lack. Flourishing, flourishing, flourishing. Amen. Hallelujah. Job 36. We're seeing this is for a lifetime. For a lifetime. God wants this to be the continual flow of our life. This, this is, you know, when you look at what we were talking about this morning about righteousness, this is one of the benefits. Do you notice in one, all of these, the righteous shall flourish? Those who fear the Lord will spend their days in prosperity. It's continually connected to this relationship we have with God. Job 36, verse 11. If they obey and serve Him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. The New Living says if they listen and obey God, they will be blessed with prosperity throughout their lives. They will be blessed with prosperity throughout their lives if they listen to and obey God. Blessed with prosperity throughout their lives. All their years will be pleasant. It's not just for you. It's for your home and your family. Psalm 112 is such a great description of our life. Our, our life as the righteousness of God. Psalm 112. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord, that delights greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. This is not just for, for you personally. This is for your household. He wants your whole family to prosper. He wants your prosperity to to spill over into your family, wealth and riches in your house. The Jerusalem translation says, there are riches and wealth for my family. Riches and wealth for my family. Amplified uses the word prosperity. Prosperity and welfare, which means things are well for me. Prosperity are in my house. And we know the next couple of chapters over in Psalm 1115. 115, forgive me. <laughs> Psalm 115. Verses 12 through 14. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you... More and more, you and your children. He shall increase you more and more. God wants us to know Him as God who is more than enough. He does not want us to be limited to knowing Him as the God who can just barely meet the need. He wants us to be intimately acquainted and so confident in our relationship with who He really is as the all-sufficient, the meter of every need, the meter of every supply. He wants us to know Him because it pleases Him when we prosper. It gives Him glory and honor when people see the goodness and the prosperity that He's poured out in our lives. Hallelujah. He wants us to have Surplus. Surplusage. Surplus. And to do that, we're going to have to bring our attention to these scriptures again and again and let them build an image in us so that we see things fully supplied that we see the extra to live on, that we see the fragments that remain. Hallelujah. Because He's more than enough. My husband is such a giver. He expresses his love to his family by wanting to do things for us. When I have traveled back and forth, he has stood outside. He, you know, of course, we have iPhones and you can follow each other and know where you're at. And so he knows when I'm about to pull up. 
And for the last three years that I've been traveling back and forth, he has met me with roses and fresh flowers every time I have pulled up, Hallelujah. returning from a trip. So, so loving. Well, one Christmas, a few years back, he took me to the mall, and there was a specific kind of perfume that I wanted. And he took me to the mall, and we were there at the, at, in Dillard's at the counter, and, and so I, they pulled out the perfume, they showed me the size, I smelled it, that's the one, and he, then he reaches over and tells the lady, give her two bottles. And I said, no, 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 don't get me two bottles. If you want to, just get me this eyeshadow kit, because they had this really nice, you know, <laughs> eyeshadow collection. Now listen, the first thing that I realized a few weeks later is that I, I just kind of missed it here because I could have had one in both locations of my favorite perfume. But I talked him out of it because I thought, no, 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 don't, that's a waste. Don't buy me two things of perfume. I could have had one in both houses, right? So here's, this was about two or two, maybe three years ago, and I've had this eyeshadow kit, and it has all, it's Estee Lauder, it's got all the nice little eyeshadows, the brown collection, and all these other collections over here, and in the middle it has like uh, two eyeliners and, and uh, some areas of lip gloss, and, and I've used it, I've used it, I've, I've enjoyed it. And about three weeks ago, you know, I have this eyeliner out, and I put and I, I make up on. I'm putting it on. I've had this two and a half, maybe three years. And when I set it down, I noticed that it jiggled loose, and I said, "There's something under the eyeshadow trays. It pulls out. It opens up. There are blushes <laughs> under the eyeshadow." And immediately, God said, it's been there all the time, and you didn't know what was supplied for you. And I started saying, Lord, show me what else is right up under my nose. Show me what else is right up under my nose that is a supply and a provision that I haven't seen. It's right there. Three years I've been putting on eyeshadow and, did, and saying, I need to buy a new blush. There's six blushes under those eyeshadow trays. I mean, one for every shade of whatever you're wearing. The brown, the pinks, the corals, it's all there. There was a full supply and I didn't even see it. Didn't even know it was there. It was there all the time. What else is there? that we're not seeing? What else has God put right up under our nose? Let's ask Him right now. Father, we ask You, reveal to us those things You have put in our life, provisions, supplies, increase that we haven't recognized. In Jesus' name. There was a man who was believing God. He was a partner with Brother Copeland. He was believing God for a specific increase in his life, really it, it having a need financially. And he began to pray. And God kept bringing to his attention some blueprints that he had in his attic of something that he had devised long before. And he just kind of disregarded it and disregarded it. And finally, the Lord got his attention and told him, go get those blueprints out and told him exactly what to do with them. And he became a multimillionaire of something that had been in his attic, a design for a specific type of a brake that goes on a specific truck that, that the, the whatever corporation, I don't know if it was Ford or Chrysler or whatever, were, were trying to fix this type of brake and not able to get it. And he had this power brake or this air brake of some kind of a brake design that had been sitting in his attic all of those years. And he became a multimillionaire because of God's idea. God had given him that plan, had given him that design. It was there. But God had to convince him to get it and go take it. What's in our lives that God has provided? He's going to show us. He's going to show us. I want you to come tell me. 
And, and don't be embarrassed. Listen, I could have kept my little story about my eyeshadow, my <laughs> eyeshadow cakes because, you know, I've had it three years and didn't know there was blush under there. Hello? <laughs> McFly? <laughs> Father, we're so grateful that you love us, that you desire to show us your glory, your goodness. Lord, we want to see you and know you and be intimately acquainted with you as the God of more than enough. And we want you to be glorified by the prosperity and the goodness that you procure unto us. We submit ourselves to your increase. We submit ourselves to your blessing. Jesus became the curse so that we would be partakers of this blessing and heirs to this promise. We receive it and submit ourselves to that blessing flow. Thank you, Lord, for prospering us. And we give you all the glory and all the praise. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Have you received of the word? Isn't he good to us? Hallelujah. Praise God. Our God is more than enough. We're going to see that more and more as we move forward. Praise God. I encourage you this Thursday and Friday, tune in online. Pastor Nancy Dufresne is going to be at the Little Rock location. You're all invited to come down if you'd like. It's only six and a half hours to drive. Pastor might make it in six, but... I encourage you, tune in if you can. Watch it at a later time on, your YouTube, on our YouTube account. But uh, feed on what God is pouring out there. And um, we're excited also about our faith explosion. 20 years anniversary celebration that's coming up here as well. So get your expectation. God's continuing to be uh, moving us into the gain, the transition, and the victory. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Let's declare the vision of our church. The vision of this church is to build people's faith and to frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you. I love you.